So I think that the, um, uh, one of the interesting things about listening to uh, Bob and uh, what he's accomplished and continues to accomplish in his life is that, uh, um, you know, it's very hard to keep up with that guy. And, uh, and it really is amazing uh, for me to watch his tremendous innovations and creativity over time and uh, me trying to keep up with him. And uh, every one of us, even uh, when I was here as an assistant professor with uh, Stu Myers and uh, Bob and myself, uh, that um, every day was a fountain of uh, just information uh, that he gave us. Uh, today, I and follow on a little bit from what Andre said and others have said as well, is to talk about uh, dynamic risk management and uh, the cost of constraints. And I don't know if I'll be able to get through all of this in uh, my talk this today, but it just sort of marrying some ideas that <coughs> I've had um, over the last uh, period of time. And basically, um, what I would like to talk about is just sort of two ge general strands, okay, here. And it all relates to Bob and what Bob has taught me uh, over time. And a lot of the ideas I had when I'm listening to things today and, and referring to Bob and his work and others is whether I had original ideas myself or if Bob had the idea and somehow he told me the ideas and uh, that's how I learned to do things, but whatever. Um, I'll pretend some of these ideas are mine, I guess. But basically, um, I thought that the one way to talk about trust, which is uh, something I agree with Bob and uh, his current thinking on it for the last number of years, is just a very important part of finance. And when Bob extended sort of the functions of finance originally to include pricing, market pricing, and to include trust or asymmetric information, you know, I really didn't uh, understand the import of the asymmetric information and trust ideas as uh, much as I sort of do now. But I really think that a lot of it has to do with a lack of trust. Another way to look at a lack of trust is the constraints that are imposed on others because they don't trust them. And uh, if you have my young, uh, my very youngest grandsons, you don't allow them to do anything they want now that I have my daughters are very old in that, uh, you know, I have no constraints on them whatsoever. So I have to trust them uh, to deal with life. So in a lot of ways, what I've been trying to do uh, in recent times is sort of get a sa measure what the cost of constraints are. And that's another way to look at what the loss of trust is or what how trust affects us through the cost of these constraints. And one of the interesting things is that the reason trust and constraints are so important is because of uncertainty. And as Bob's told us forever, if we start off with uncertainty first and then think about how we build models of uncertainty, and don't think of uncertainty as second order, but it's primary and first order, it gets us much further along uh, than uh, otherwise. And finance people in life, we generally have to embrace uncertainty as opposed to figure out how to fear it, and we use it in that way. So I think that in a lot of ways uh, with finance industry that we're seeing now with the advent of data and uh, more and more data, and that basically uh, it really creates a way of seeing how we've thought about innovation for a myriad years, but it also transcends not only to finance, but it transcends to uh, industry generally in innovation. And I think that basically innovation is compresses time, makes things faster and individualizes, that makes it not one shoe fits all, but tries to, as Bob has told us in the past, create solutions to individual problems. And the third dimension, which I think is important, is creating flexibility or adaptability. When we are uncertain about things, the more uncertain we are, you know, the more costly it is to act and adapt. And therefore, uncertainty has a huge effect on basically how we can adapt and how flexible we can be in our decision making. And so a lot of what we're seeing in finance and a lot of we see in terms of what we talked about today and uh, you know, from Bob's initial perspectives and others 
implementation of those perspectives and testing of those perspectives is ways to reduce the uncertainty or reduce the cost of adaptability or the cost of flexibility. And um, so innovation occurs basically to do that, to compress time. If you look at the functions of finance that Bob had talked about and built initially, which is transactions we see in finance, how you speed up transactions or financing large-scale projects, how you speed that up or how you can individualize and how you can uh, additionally uh, save for the future risk management type thing. And then pricing, you know, the idea of prices that at one time we had so few prices now with Amazon and other types of things, we can see myriad prices and the increase in the number of prices allows us to have more informed decisions and uh, to reduce uh, the error of our model. So basically, uh, constraints themselves can either really impede innovation or they can uh, lead to innovation, you know, and, and those two are always fighting each other because the larger the error of our models, the more uncertainty we have, basically the idea is that, uh, you know, the more cheaters are gonna come in because they can, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, just Bob said many years ago that, uh, you know, people reverse engineer models and then using the error of the model, they can use it against, or against you. So I think that, Interesting enough is that uh, an area that I've been thinking about and working on, trying to work on, is really if you can measure the cost of constraints, is the constraint, constraints are, are give up in returns or an implicit cost. In other words, if you're constrained to do something because you don't trust or can't do it, then basically uh, you'll figure out ways to, uh, you won't do things, and as a result of that, that'll be costly in terms of lost returns. And so how do we end up in a situation where we end up mitigating uh, those costs? So I think that, um, and I, I won't go into this in large amounts of detail, is that really uh, with data, and the idea is trying to move in all innovation and what we're doing in finance from being one in which we're reacting to being proactive reactive to proactive so that if you can measure things, I mean basically measurement and using our models and measurement, you can be more proactive in what we do and as a result of being able to measure, reduce the error of the model and being more proactive, then we can innovate and create ways in which we can um, add greater value for ourselves. So it's the, it's one time or other, it's the idea is that when we have, uh, you know, in our society, basically the idea we have those who are innovators, who are the hunters, you know, and the farmers, basically the idea is that the farmers and others are going to constrain hunters from really trying to add value. And the interesting, th because why? Because of the constraints maintain their uh, positions and power. So the interesting issue is, then that leads to the fact that farmers can, in, uh, hunters can innovate, right? Because if everyone's receptive to all change and they didn't believe and they had measurement, then basically we wouldn't see the innovations because they would uh, have already been done. So I think that basically if we look at constraints, okay, as we know that every one of us ten, or everyone tends to concentrate on alpha or the ability to create abnormal returns, but we have to think about uh, one run of time, the fact that we don't uh, repeat the game often, we only play one time once, and we don't have in finance really or in life sort of the law of large numbers when we think of time, because we don't, it's not like playing Go or playing cards, uh, the expertise in cards, where you can keep rerunning and know what the probabilities are, and we try to take ways in which we look at this one run of time, but it's not a repeated game. And so the constraints of others, you know, really are the vigorous or the profits. When Bob played cards, he told me that he always tried not only to understand the cards, but he understand the tell of other people. And he hedged by looking at the lights so that his eyes would dilate and he would not show when he was excited about the cards that he had in his deck. So in a lot of ways, when you think about negotiation, it's the idea that, or benefiting that, basically want 
uh, to exchange with others that both are made better off because you're eliminating or reducing constraints or the idea you're mitigating constraints. So constraints lead to profit opportunities if you're gonna know uh, we're talking about some of the innovations we're talking about here because of constraints, you're trying to mitigate those. So the interesting thing is that if we see there's an implicit cost because of constraints in the marketplace, that it, those constraints show up in the, as a generalized form of bargaining, not mono a mono, but a generalized for, form of bargaining, where because of constraints, participants in the market knowingly give up returns, okay? And so the question is, if some are knowingly giving up returns, does that then transcend to the market prices are affected, so there are higher rates of return for those who can generate trust and, of others and can deviate from you know, they uh, deviate from uh, uh, just the naive strategies involved. So the constraints give you the edge, or the, the edge, or the vigorish, as it's called, and Bob taught me once what vigorish was, and, uh, you know, in the game, and uh, that's in a good way, Bob. So. <laughs> and so it really creates uh, what I call uh, not alpha, but omega, where omega was taken off in my way of thinking about it from Ohm's law, which says basically the um, idea, the greater the resistance in the market, the less the voltage is, and so it pays those who are intermediaries or others to come in and uh, intermediate those differences. So um, Bob has, uh, and I've heard him, I gave talk like this, independent of Bob, and then I heard Bob give a talk which was similar to what I, I'm saying here in this slide. But really, the idea in terms of making returns in the marketplace are three things that are important. One is sort of prediction of cash flows, which is turning over inventory. That's looking forward and finding out whether assets are cheap or rich, uh, or factors are cheap or rich or whatever. And uh, most think of that as a way to enhance returns. And the second way is providing intermediation <laughs> services to the market. That's liquidity, risk transfer thing when people want to transfer risk or constrained, they can't hold the risks and have to transfer them to others. So that's proactive is sort of forecasting, turning over the inventory as proactive forecast in the future. Uh, reactive is seeing why people want to dispense of this inventory or sell it. And the third way is holding the inventory itself. And basically, uh, you know, I always use the example of the elephant to give me an illustration of what a constraint is. And many investors who are managing money for others have a tracking error constraint, and they can't deviate too much from the benchmark in that. And that constraint means that the error has to be very small, and they have to stay close to the elephant. They're forecasting where the elephant's going to go, and they know the elephant's going to go maybe into the forest after it feeds by the water with the reeds, but they stay close to the elephant because they're very worried the elephant can go far away uh, into the water and not to the uh, uh, grazing, uh, not to the sleeping area there and ahead. And so they're constrained. So the question is that those who have trust and of others and have spent time garnering trust, can they deviate a lot? Can they have a longer term theme and not a short term theme? And basically as a result of a longer term theme can end up having a higher rates of return because they have time on their side or trust on their side to be able to achieve that. Now, um, you know, the second element I talk about is intermediation services, which is the poor elephant is constrained to eat 20 hours a day. You know, it doesn't regurgitate its food. So it, uh, basically the dung of the elephant is rich in nutrients. So what happens, the smart animals who follow the elephant uh, to garner the dung of the elephant realize that, you know, they, that's a way in which they can earn greater rates of return. So the interesting issue is that you can either try to forecast where the elephant's going to go, or in the intermediation business that's sitting there is forecasting, uh, is taking and understanding when the dung of the elephant is rich so that these constraints uh, can be mitigated by essentially uh, using uh, what that 
has uh, given us. So that's a constraint. And also staying close to the elephant is a constraint or staying close to the benchmark. So the inter really interesting issue is what are the costs of uh, doing these types of activities? And the third area, which is just very interesting to me, is the market risk or the beta risk, the, the holding the systematic exposures in the market. And uh, this is holding the inventory, okay? There's index funds or factor funds or ETFs. There's just holding the risk. They're holding the inventory. But there's really no risk dynamics or no thought of being proactive about this. And uh, I think Bob's work in my way of thinking about it talks about how you tend to hedge constraints and what the costs of those constraints are given you have demanders and suppliers of hedging, hedging uh, activities. And, um, and so uh, we are generally long assets, growth assets in the market. So basically this idea of constraint not to deviate too far from a benchmark or strategic portfolio have a cost and you have to really sacrifice risk management and therefore sacrifice uh, compound returns. As Andre said, and I'll concentrate on that, you know, compound returns are really the key part of uh, these activities. I had a, a triangle that I had, but I'll skip forward on that. I just I can talk about the same thing here relating to Bob's work, and then I'll get back to this cost of constraints in a moment. So we know proactive versus reactive. We have intuition as a model, and if the environment is changing slowly or not changing at all, then using intuition is fine. It has a low error to it and little uncertainty, and we can be proactive in, in what we do. So the idea, we know that in economics or innovation, if you know some for certain, there's, no, uh, there's nothing that uh, you don't know, then basically you tend to build it in hardware. You tend to build it in a way that is the most efficient, lowest cost part of your curve in which you're producing, um, producing output. The more uncertain you have, the more software you have. The more you move to software because that allows you an ability to change and under uncertainty, um, you know, if we can reduce the error of models, then basically it will create more flexibility, reduce the cost of the option, and we can have uh, much greater flexibility in innovation and how we do things in, in our lives. When we look at what we've learned from Bob over time in terms of fallacies and understanding uncertainty, he taught me many years ago, basically, that data mining the past you know, is usually real, is what we tend to do. So that basically our, um, our, our algorithms and that what we have, we have to be very worried about the fact that if we're gonna build algorithms or innovation, that basically we are taking uh, and data mining the past. The information set is very large relative to what we tend to um, be able to understand and know because risks are changing, the dynamics is changing, we're not drawing from the same earns over time. So the correlation structures are changing as well. So we don't have the idea that we can be drawing from the same earns and the same associations that we have. And third, with error in the model, we have what the cheapest deliver problem is that people reverse engineer the error of our model and the model tends to destruct over time. So basically, we have to worry about those as well. So I think that if we look at the, um, if we look at just uh, quickly here before I get into some empirical results, if we look at the tracking error constraint really converts investment from an absolute to a relative return. So it's an information ratio or it's a sharp ratio. It's stay close to the benchmark, stay close to the herd. So it controls the cheating and it reduces explicit monitoring costs with potentially a cost in terms of loss returns. And I have uh, the empirical evidence really suggests that th research that I have done suggests that if you look at the tracking error constraint that most mutual funds have or active managers have is that basically by sticking close to the benchmark that what happens is that the models would suggest that basically if you have a constraint, 
then you try to maximize, but subject to the constraint, you try to mitigate some of the effects of the constraint. And what you find in the model is that the most tracking error difficult assets to not hold are the higher risk assets, which have a very large effect on your portfolio returns. So basically, if you love assets that are high risk, you love assets that are medium risk, and you love assets that are low risk, how do you finance those? You, know, you have to finance them by selling assets that are not as risky because, or highly correlated with your benchmark because that has the least uh, tracking error effect. So as a result of that, asset managers, and this, the data support this, who are, uh, who are uh, active mutual funds or others, tend to overweight higher risk stocks in their portfolio because they have to hold the risk to, uh, to actually mitigate it. And there's dynamics in the sense the greater the uh, expectation of their alpha to their uncertainty, the more they're doing this. And, the, and on, at times of shock, they tend to go uh, back uh, to, their, to their benchmark. So I want to move to, uh, from here to um, and summarizing that to the idea that what we see is most static managers, and this relates to some of the pension work and others that Bob has done uh, with others, is that basically most asset allocation strategies, and I've talked around the world to myriad pension funds and sovereign funds and that, really have a static asset allocation model. They got the common approach is a benchmark and a tracking error. Say, for example, 40% in bonds and 60% in stock is a policy portfolio. And they're based on static weights and averages and a uh, profile of risk that is average. And then buckets are filled, actually, with bond or stock allocations and, uh, and, and the like. So the only dynamics that adjust in these policy portfolios are very slow over time. And, or their mean reversion type strategies going back to static rules. The life cycle models are static, as we heard today, uh, based on age, glide paths, and models. And, um, and basically, uh, you know, the idea of, of cross-sectional diversification is enhanced through these activities. We're spending too much time on cross-sectional allocations and six cross-sectional risk management and not enough time on dynamic risk management and the effects of risk on our portfolios. These policy portfolios that we see do have uh, a way, as Bob said in the past, is that you know, risk management, cash or reserves, is a policy. When we first studied finance, you know, the idea was you said, how much cash do you hold? and how much equity do you hold, you know, the cash equity balance. That was the initial thing we had talked about. And then we talked about diversification, the idea of having diversification, and the idea that was great innovation. And when I and, and, and Fisher and uh, Bob initially got involved, interested in, in that third dimension, which is insurance, you know, the idea how much to buy protection, how much protection to buy. The problem is with uh, reserves, it's static, it's a cushion, but you don't know what to do with a cushion. You know, it's no dynamics to how much cushion do I hold? You know, when I was married to one of my wives, they, um, they uh, told me I couldn't sit in the couch in the, in the room because they had this plastic thing on the couch sheet. And I said, what good is the darn pillows that we have if I can never use them? No, no, that's your, I don't know what they're reserved for, but anyway, and then, when you have diversification, like today we have wonderful diversification. I have great cross-sector diversification, but the stock market was down 4%, you know, so I don't, it doesn't bother, I don't know. I don't have to worry about what my assets did. My diversification was gone because of the beta effect, okay? And even though I invest internationally, that's gone too because I know that it's gonna be down around the world, okay? And so insurance is also protection, but we don't know what to, how much money to spend on insurance and how often to readjust the insurance. And so what I did was I looked just quickly as saying a 60-40 strategy, if you think about a 5% risk premium over time, 
that if you hold 40% in bonds, you know, and then that's about a 2% cost for this insurance of whole, you know, instead of holding 100% equities to move into bonds. And then you had a maximum drawdown uh, of the stock bond portfolio uh, in 2008 around 37%. So basically the, um, you know, diversification is lost with tail events. Uh, you know, and the maximum drawdown was 58, 55% in 2008. If you lose 20% more, approximately every 10 years in expectation, you know, that's another 2%. So if you want to think about 100% equities, and it's fine. Your insurance cost is going to cost, again, relatively uh, 2% a year. And then I ran a put protection at 35% down just from the data existing from 1996 to current time going through the two crises, 55% uh, down in, in the dot-com bust and also the similar amount in the, um, in, uh, in uh, 08. And again, that cost was around 2% uh, just to keep rolling put to make sure you guaranteed yourself a 35% uh, drawdown. So, and you kept repurchasing your puts every month and striking new ones. And this is using actual market prices. And so with one run of time, okay, and this is actually, I developed this independently and then uh, realized again, it was Samuelson, and probably Merton and Samuelson have talked about this as well. But one run of time with time diversification, the idea that even though you have all these ETFs or index funds out there, there are no bench, there's no tracking error and there's no fees, but there's no risk management. So the idea that if you can measure risk or manage risk over time, what you show basically is that when you take your uh, average return will be unaffected. Sometimes you have high risk, sometimes you have low risk, your average return is unaffected, but your volatility shoots up of your port your time volatility shoots up of your portfolio. So your non-diversified strategy in risk in time. And the interesting thing is if you can measure the volatility, you know that compound return is enhanced by reduction in volatility, by measurement of volatility, and also by skewness, obviously. And so as a result of that, even though you're in index funds or you're in uh, these types of strategies that are uh, fully diversified, there's no time diversification. If it's the case that cross-sectional diversification is such a great benefit, why isn't time diversification a great benefit? Time diversification is not a great benefit if you're only interested in average returns. But if you're interested in the growth of your portfolio or compound return, and the earns we're drawing from are changing each period of time or not constant, then basically we have to worry about that as well. One other interesting uh, data which struck me as very fascinating is that I went back and used the Ibbotson data that he existed from 1857 to current time, one run of time, okay? And there, the average compound return was 5% uh, a year annual return. So that was uh, $3,000 on a $1 investment over this 150 or so year period of time. Yet, on the other hand, if you could exclude in every five year period, two and a half percent of the worst observations, the months that had the worst returns, okay, then your compound return would grow to be 9% a year or $1 would go to 1 million four. And conversely, if you were not there in the months which had the uh, best performing months, okay, the five percent, the two and a half percent of the best performing months, then your compound return would only be 1% in excess of the risk-free rate, all this in excess of the risk-free rate. So I just want to say one run of time, we understand several things. One is tails are very important to the distribution of returns. You know, the, uh, the, 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 um, most of the returns are determined by the tails of the distribution and not by the center of the distribution of returns. And if we look at the, um, 
this, I, I gin this up for my, my own thing because I had to make it symmetric to Philip Anderson's quote. So I, it's my quote, okay? But uh, as Philip Anderson said, most of the real world is controlled as much by the tails of the distribution as by the means or averages, okay? By the exceptional, not the mean, and by the catastrophes, not the safety drip. And so basically in physics, you can run experiments and it's all the nonlinearities that show up that create the greatest experimental results from them, okay? In finance, we don't have that luxury. We don't have thousands and thousands of observations. We have, but they don't really mean very much. So if we have one run of time, the distributions are changing. So for us, however, we have information that exists, which is very valuable to us. And what I call that, and I think if Doug Breeden could make it today, unfortunately, he couldn't because of his, uh, his wife is, is very ill that basically we have information because we have in our world, okay, we have option prices. And option prices give us information about the road ahead. So there are ways of finance. You know, the option prices give us information about the distribution of risks. And as Andre said earlier in his talk, and in Bob's work, you know, as well, said, what's the most important thing in life? Is it the mean? You know, is it, the mean will be there. It'll catch up with you. But every time, what's important is risk. Risk is the most important, and that's the most important to compound return. It's the most important to things we do all the time. So to compound re each period of time, it's really, if you can think about the road ahead and going from, I used to go from here to, to Lexington, you know, and, I didn't have any information. There was no measurement or anything. So I just ended up in a traffic jam and I got home two hours later or I got home in 20 minutes. You know, it was, it was uh, whatever it was. But basically over time, then they had a helicopter and the helicopter told me, you're in a traffic jam, you know, that was it. And nowadays with sensors and ways and things like that, we can see the road ahead, okay? Even though we have in finance, the option prices are forward information of the distribution of risk. Now it's a risk neutral world, but if the mean is not very important, and, and when I drive home, I don't care about what the road is 20 kilometers from now. I want to know what the road is, you know, 100 yards from now or 200 yards from now or half a kilometer. So it's basically in compound return, every period matters and basically is said that we can, if we can measure the risks by using the information in the option market and give us the information as to, uh, as to uh, what the road ahead is. And using, uh, you know, is really using Merton's contributions and, uh, and moving risks away from expectations. The paper by Poon and Granger and others really said that it's possible to use the option markets to measure risk. In fact, the option markets were better estimates of risk than all the macro models and Garch models that had been used. And Granger obviously had a bias to using Garch type models to forecast risk or high frequency models or what. The market prices is very important. When Bob and I started uh, doing work in option pricing, uh, there was only over the counter markets. And then in 73, and we did this, as Bob has said many times, not from the point of view of trying to trade in the option markets, but then it was beneficial to do that, actually, after the fact of developing the model, but from trying to understand exactly how this insurance worked or how the price of protection worked and, and getting estimates of these premiums. Basically, nothing was traded. Now we have options traded on 4,000 securities around the world. And, and you can garner is using the uh, Litzenberger and Breeden methods or Breeden and Litzenberger methods or other methods be able to extract from those uh, prices what the market's saying, the ways is saying, the market intelligent, the crowdsourcing information about risk. And so I just did the same thing as using the data, because uh, I only had data back to 1996 option data, using that between uh, the S&P 500 in a risk managed way and looking at the distribution of risk, if you looked at a 60-40 static strategy versus the information in the market. Now, the interesting thing is the distribution is looks, you know, about you can truncate risk, but the interesting thing about risk and compound return, which I never really realized, and Einstein said one of the most important forces in the universe is compound interest. 
I, that guy was smart, you know, I wish I, I, he was I, smart. Because, but what he maybe meant as well is uncertainty has a huge effect on compound return. Just if you can just truncate the tails slightly, you know, and shift the distribution a little bit to the right and do that in a more consistent way. Over time, the compound return becomes dramatic. The distributions just continue to shift, even not too much. You know, it doesn't have to be spectacular. It's just amazing uh, to, see, to see the differences. So you know, another thing that's very fascinating, which we can do by our measurement, again, this idea of reducing constraints by measurement, is that if you think tails of the distribution are important, then you have to know what's the most important thing from a macro point of view. From a macro point of view, it's the tails of the distribution. It's not the middle. We don't, everyone fesses about the middle of the distribution, but the tails are crucial for everything we do. And so the, um, the central bankers who are always worried about all the middle of the distribution, as Bob has told us, you know, start with uncertainty first. And if the tails have the biggest effect, that's important. One thing I, we see is that the returns on equities are very lowly correlated with the returns on bonds over long periods of time. The return on, on inflation assets are very low correlation with the return on equities over very long periods of time. With shocks, however, you can have high positive correlation or high negative correlation. So you can have, as, uh, uh, as said earlier, that bonds are always going to hedge equities. Because if they would, then Bob has told me many times, they would have a negative rate of return, you know, because they have a nice negative correlation. Sometimes they're very positively correlated, and sometimes, because you can't get zero without always being negatively correlated. Sometimes they're positively correlated, sometimes negatively. And the theory really comes down to when the central bankers are goofing off and making the wrong mistakes, not making the right decision, when you're going to end up with large positive correlation with inflation and with equities and bonds all moving in the same direction at one time. Interesting enough, you can can use the information in the option markets to actually estimate or estimate what these correlations and the extremes might be. You know, for example, if we know that the uh, risk of equities is increased and the risk of bonds is increased on the downside, that might send there's positive correlation. If the converse is true, it could be negative. You have to map that into an actual correlation uh, to be able to use it. One uh, last point here, uh, I guess. Yeah, a couple of points, but um, if you um, just look forward here, okay, then basically what I did was looking from a macro point of view to look at the implied left and right tail risks of the S&P 500 at and around the time of the crisis itself. And there's one point I just want to raise by these data. One is that you see the blue uh, line here, the blue thing for those that are colored blind, it's the one in the bottom. Okay, and that's the prices of the uh, tail risk, or the uh, you know the prices of the risk implied by prices, the insurance risk of the prices of puts, and you see that uh, is after the Bear Stearns thing, it went up from a level of 10 to a level of 20 percent and stayed there, and then at the time of Lehman and others, it tended to be fine. But what happened was that, and by the way, the red graph is just the skewness number. It's the upside to downside of the uh, implied distribution. And um, so we noticed a very big negative skewness, and then it reverted back after a period of time. But here is the case that having um, government policy, if you looked at the data, the market was really thinking, this is again this idea of trust, that the market was thinking that the government was going to do something. You know, the Congress was going to pass laws that were rational. The market collapsed after they collapsed. Their trust was lost. So the government, now whether that's a right policy or wrong policy, that I think was one of the reasons we ended up in this tremendous decay in market prices was the inaction of the government at the time to do what the market had expected them to do and basically by passing legislation you know, which wasn't passed for months afterwards. And once the legislation was passed, the distributions, the risk again fell dramatically in the market. It wasn't necessarily as much in the Lehman thing, if you looked at the data, as it was in actually the failure of trust of the government to act. And so maybe is that right or wrong? That's a different issue. But that's what really uh, what happened.
And if you look at the um, macroprudentials models uh, of risk and using market prices, um, the interesting question that ar arises is if the government would use market prices, would that destroy the validity of market prices? So therefore, the signals work because the government itself is constrained to not act. If the and so that the market can act and know means the government is not going to act, or the central bankers are not going to act. I read a story just uh, a couple of days ago. Now they reduce rates. They're not going to increase rates for 30 meetings or something. So what, the policy, which is trying to micromanage all these little ups and downs, are the wrong policy. And as a result of that, the data are informative because the government is constrained not to act. And other investors are constrained not to act because of the policy portfolios they put into place. So the option market is another venue, which I'm trying to say here, is the option market is rich in information uh, because of constraints, okay? And not only is it just used as a tool, puts and calls, okay, but it's used by smart money to tell us what the road ahead is. If everyone stays on the highway, even though Waze is telling them there's a traffic accident ahead, then basically you can benefit because of the constraints of others. They're giving up returns and you can deviate from the route. So I think that in, some, in conclusion here, I want to say another quote of Einstein's, I didn't say this, but uh, one who follows the crowd will usually get no further than the crowd and the one who walks alone which is my good friend Robert Merton, is likely to find himself in places no one has ever been. And Bob has uh, never walked alone. He's found himself in places that have all made us richer through his knowledge and what he's given to us. So I think when Einstein was thinking about this, Bob, he was thinking about you and uh, what you have done. And for my own self, okay, there are heroes in life, okay, and as um, Emerson, Ernest Hemingway said, okay, if you get older, it's harder to have heroes, but it's sort of necessary, okay? And I have no one, Bob Merton, uh, who's been my friend now for 50 years, 51, I guess, and he's still my hero and lifelong mentor. So thank you, Bob.